Joshua chapter 1. Now after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spake unto Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' minister, saying, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now therefore arise, go over this Jordan, thou and all this people, unto the land which I do give to them, even to the children of Israel. Every place that the sole of your foot shall tread upon, that have I given unto you, as I said unto Moses. From the wilderness in this Lebanon, even unto the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hiltites, and unto the great sea, toward the going down of the sun, shall be your coast. There shall not any man be able to stand before thee all the days of thy life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with thee. I will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. Be strong and of a good courage, for unto this people shall thou divide for an inheritance the land, which I swear unto their fathers to give them. Only be thou strong and very courageous, that thou mayest observe to do according to all the law which Moses my servant commanded thee. Turn not from it to the right hand or to the left, that thou mayest prosper whithersoever thou goest. This book of the law shall not be depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. Have, I, have not I commanded thee? Be strong and of a good courage. Be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed. For the Lord thy God is with thee, whithersoever thou goest. Then Joshua commanded the officers of the people, saying, Pass through the host, and command the people, saying, Prepare your victuals, for within three days ye shall pass over this Jordan, to go in to possess the land, which the Lord your God giveth you to possess it, and to the Rebanites, and to the Gad Gadis, and to half the tribe of Manasseh, spake Joshua, saying, Remember the word which Moses the servant of the Lord commanded you, saying, The Lord your God hath given you rest, and hath given you this land. Your wives, your little ones, and your cattle shall remain in the land which Moses gave you on this side Jordan. But ye shall pass before your brethren armed, all the mighty men of Valor, and help them. Until the Lord hath given your brethren rest, as he hath given you, and they also have possessed the land which the Lord your God giveth them. Then ye shall return unto the land of your possession, and enjoy it, which Moses the Lord's servant gave you on this side Jordan, towards the sun rising. And they answered Joshua, saying, All that thou commandest us we will do, and whithersoever thou sendest us we will go. According as we hearkened unto Moses in all things, so will we hearken unto thee, only the Lord thy God be with thee, as he was with Moses. Whosoever he be that doth rebel against thy commandment, and will not hearken unto thy words, and all that thou commandest him, he shall be put to death. Only be strong and of a good courage. Amen. Thank you, brother. So, yeah, like I said, there is no need here to even... Uh, Even move your bookmark. If you've got Deuteronomy numbered, we'll just carry right over into Joshua. <clears throat> In verse 1 of the book of Joshua, you have this saying, Now after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spake unto Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' minister, saying, Now, it talks here about Joshua being Moses' minister. And we saw a little bit of this play out throughout the scriptures. If you would, turn with me to Exodus chapter 17. Exodus chapter 17. Keeping your finger there, a bookmark in Joshua chapter 1. And we see Joshua changed from a soldier to a servant to a successor to the great man of God, Moses. In Exodus chapter 17... Beginning in verse 8, we find the first mention here of Joshua. It says, Then came Amalek 
and fought with Israel in Rephidim. And Moses said unto Joshua, Choose us out men, and go out, fight with Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand on the top of the hill with the rod of God in mine hand. So Joshua did as Moses had said to him, and fought with Amalek. And Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up to the top of the hill. And it came to pass when Moses held up his hand that Israel prevailed. And when he let down his hand, Amalek prevailed. But Moses' hand were heavy, and they took a stone and put it under him, and sat thereon. And Aaron and Hur stayed up his hands, the one on the one side, the other on the other side, and his hands were steady unto the going down of the sun. And Joshua discomfited Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. And the Lord said unto Moses, Write this for a memorial in a book, and rehearse it in the ears of Joshua, for I will utterly put out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. And Moses built an altar and called the name of it Jehovah Nisi. For he said, Because the Lord hath sworn that the Lord will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. So we see here that, that as a soldier and also as a servant in submission to Moses, his leader, Joshua discomfited Amalek, slew them with an edge of the sword, and so great was the slaughter that the book was to be written, rehearsed in the ears of Joshua for many years, that utterly Amalek would be put out from before the children of Israel. I love this story. It shows the great teamwork associated with the people of God holding up the arms of the man of God so that the war could go forth according to God's plan. And, I, and, and Aaron and Hur there steadied his hand as Joshua swung the sword down there in battle. After this, we find in Exodus chapter 20... That great tale of the Ten Commandments told unto us. The account of the voice of God thundering from heaven. And if you pick up in Exodus 20 and verse 18, the Bible says, And all the people saw the thunderings and the lightnings and the noise of the trumpet and the mountain smoking. And when the people saw it, they removed and stood afar off. So everyone behold this, beheld this terrible sight of God speaking all these words, saying... And then he lists the commandments tenfold to the people, thundering from the mountain above, lightnings, thunderings, noise of the trumpet, the very mountain smoking the people saw and removed afar off. Verse 19 it says, And they said unto Moses, Now this had to have been a terrible sight for such a proclamation at large to be made by all the people. Speak thou with us, and we will hear. But let not God speak with us, lest we die. So terrible was the sights and the sounds and the events of that day that the people said, I don't even want to hear from God. Moses, you talk to him, and we'll just obey whatever you say. The reply from Moses in verse 20, Moses said unto the people, Fear not, for God is come to prove you, and that his fear may be before your faces that ye sin not. God came in such a terrible way so that the people would fear him above all things and they would be proven their hearts desires and their the intents of their hearts would be proven before him by their reaction here and that they would be driven to not sin before him and to keep the very commandments that he's outlining there from heaven the people nonetheless drew back where i believe at this time as moses drew near unto god to speak unto him Joshua followed suit, or at least his heart began to pull him in that direction, in his spirit, even so. Exodus chapter 24 now. Again, we're seeing Joshua transfer from soldier, servant, to successor of the man of God, Moses. In Exodus chapter 24 and verse 12, the Bible says, And the Lord said unto Moses, Come up to me into the mount and be there. He simply wants Moses to come and be with him. And he says, And I will give thee tables of stone and a law and commandments which I have written, that thou mayest teach them. And Moses rose up, and watch this, and his minister Joshua. And Moses went up into the mount of God. And the presumption there is that Joshua went with him at this time to receive of the commandments and the law which God had written. Verse 14, And he said unto the elders, Tarry ye here for us, talking about Moses, talking about Joshua, 
He refers to the elders and said, Tarry ye here for us, and behold, Aaron and her are with you. If any man have any matters to do, let him come unto them. And Moses went up into the mount, and a cloud covered the mount. And the glory of the Lord abode upon Mount Sinai, and the cloud covered it six days. And the seventh day he called unto Moses out of the midst of the cloud. And the sight of the glory of the Lord was like devouring fire on the top of the mount in the eyes of the children of Israel. And Moses went into the midst of the cloud and got him up into the mount. And Moses was in the mount forty days and... 40 nights. So Moses and Joshua had both witnessed all the terror of the Lord beforehand. They had heard the commands and they did not shirk from following him. They didn't back away like the people did. And when it came time to go up into the mountain to receive the written word from God, Moses and Joshua coupled together and joined in this journey to enter into the glory of God Almighty. The people here are still standing afar off and in their sight they saw a devouring fire from God Almighty God upon that mount. And that's all they could witness. But Moses and Joshua saw what was in the midst of a cloud. And what was in the midst of the cloud was God Almighty God bidding them to come and be there with him. And so they did. They went in and they spent 40 days and 40 nights there with God Almighty. What a journey that might have, must have been for Moses as well as his minister servant, Joshua. Now go to Numbers chapter 14. Go to Numbers chapter 14. You get past Exodus, past Leviticus, Numbers chapter 14 to the right in your Bible. And you'll find there in Numbers chapter 14, Moses, or sorry, Joshua, as he begins to transition from soldier servant to become the leader that he will be, as we read about him in the book named after him. Joshua chapter 14, start with me in verse 6. Joshua, four, or sorry, Numbers 14 and verse 6. And Joshua, the son of Nun, and Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, which were of them that searched the land, rent their clothes. So the people beheld what had happened and what they saw in the land when they went to spy it out. There were giants there. There was men that in their own sight, they perceived them to be great and mighty and terrible, their walls being the same. And in our own sight, those same men perceived those, saw them as grasshoppers. Perception was off here, and it was the same story as before. We just read about how the people saw God as this terrible fire upon the mount, and Moses and Joshua, as they drew near, didn't see him in that state at all. They saw him welcoming and bringing him in. But now the people, the Bible says, saw the giants, the son of Anak, which were come out of the giants. And they said, and we were in our own sight as grasshoppers. So were we in their sight. In other words, they perceived that they were nothing to stand before this mighty army. And so they bring back this bad report, this evil report of the land. We pick up in Numbers 14 and verse 6. Joshua and Caleb rending their clothes for the evil report that the people of Israel had brought of that land. It says in verse 7, And they spake, this is Joshua and Caleb now, they spake unto all the company of the children of Israel, saying, The land which we pass through to search it is an exceeding good land. If the Lord delight in us, then he will bring us into this land and give it us a land which floweth with milk and honey. Only rebel ye not, only rebel not ye against the Lord. Neither fear ye the people of the land, for they are bred for us. Their defense is departed from them, and the Lord is with us, fear them not. Notice the difference. Back in chapter 13 and verse 33, they say, we're in our own sight as grasshoppers, and that's how these giants see us. The perception of Joshua as well as Caleb was, they're bred for us. We're going to eat them up. Their defense is departed. They've got nothing to stand on. No stronghold. The Lord is with us above all things. Do not fear those and definitely don't see yourself as grasshoppers in your sight or theirs. Fear them not. Verse 10 though, it says, but all the congregation bade, stone them with stones. And the glory of the Lord appeared in the tabernacle of the congregation before all the children of Israel. And so 
Joshua's first opportunity to step out as a leader, he wasn't well received, was he? He steps forward and he says, just trust God. Just, just count on him. Don't rebel against the Lord. Look, our enemies are bred for us. We're going to eat them up. Their defense is nothing. God is with us. And they say, stone him with stones. He's lost his mind. Have you seen those giants? And, and his first opportunity to lead was not well received at first by men. But wonderfully so, though not received by men as a leader, Joshua was accepted by God as a leader. Look at verse 33. It says, And your children shall wander. Sorry, go to 26. My bad. Verse 26, it says, Now, <clears throat> the Lord spake unto Moses and unto Aaron, saying, How long shall I bear with this evil congregation, which murmur against me? I have heard the murmurings of the children of Israel, which they murmur against me. Say unto them, As truly as I live, saith the Lord, as ye have spoken in mine ears, so will I do to you. Your carcasses shall fall in this wilderness, and all that were numbered of you according to your whole number, from twenty years old and upward, which have murmured against me, doubtless ye shall not come into the land, concerning which I swear to make you dwell therein. Save Caleb the son of Jephunneh, and Joshua the son of Nun. But your little ones, which ye said should be a prey, them will I bring in, and they shall know the land which ye have despised. But as for you, your carcasses, they shall fall in this wilderness, and your children shall wander in the wilderness forty years, and bear your whoredoms until your carcasses be wasted in the wilderness. And so, Joshua here, Caleb here, are accepted as those that would enter into the promised land. God therefore affirming that there's something different and special and unique about these, and that was they showed their faith in God when they were confronted with a danger, when they were confronted with fear of the enemy. The Bible says in verse 24 there, but my servant Caleb, because he had another spirit with him, and hath followed me fully, him will I bring into the land wherein he went, and his seed shall possess it. And I have to believe that Joshua had the same spirit as they are coupled together at the beginning of the chapter and at the end of the chapter. And God here acknowledges specially that Caleb had this other spirit. And I'll go to Deuteronomy chapter 34 and I'll affirm that Joshua held that same other spirit that the people did not retain unto. It says in Joshua, or Deuteronomy 34, and in verse 9, it said, And Joshua, the son of Nun, was full of the spirit of wisdom, for Moses had laid his hands upon him, and the children of Israel hearkened unto him, and did as the Lord commanded Moses. And so Joshua here is told that he has this unique spirit, known as the spirit of wisdom. He's full of this spirit, and I believe he possesses a similar or the same other spirit that Caleb had there in Numbers. Now in Numbers chapter 14, we see that great confidence that Caleb and Joshua held. They said that the Lord will bring them in. The Lord will give them the land. They said that the enemy would be bred to them. Their defenses come to naught. And above all, they said, the Lord is with us. And they stood firm in that promise that God made. So now we've seen the transition from soldier to servant to now successor to the leadership role that Joshua possesses. And that's just a snapshot of his journey through Exodus, Numbers, Leviticus as well, and Deuteronomy. Now we pick up in Joshua chapter 1, it says, Now, after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spake unto Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' minister, saying, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now therefore arise, go over this Jordan, thou and all this people, into the land which I do give to them, even to the children of Israel. Every place that the sole of your foot shall tread upon, that have I given you, as I said unto Moses. You know what he's telling them here? 
Tread and take, tread and take. Just go for a stroll. Go walk through that promised land. And every place that the sole of your foot treads upon, that will be given to you. There's the promise of God there. And we ought to think the same way with respect to our walk with God. Every challenge that's before us, every opportunity to overcome and to show God mighty, everything that comes in our way, simply walk with God into that scenario and that situation. Take a tread and take over whatever you are conquering at that time. Tread and take. Walk with God in that same fashion and in that same promise. Every place that the sole of your foot shall tread upon, that have I given you. Every trial, every tribulation, every struggle that you have in your life, simply take a stroll with God. Take a walk with God. He's given you power to overcome that. Now, we're going to grab here from Joshua chapter 1 some principles for leadership. And the first principle we see is that as a leader, you ought to be willing to start at the bottom. Start small in your role. We see then Joshua in verse 1 as Moses' minister now given the direct access to God. The Lord spake unto Joshua. Here he's referred to as Moses' minister. So we saw him take that journey from servant to would-be successor to now succeeding Moses who has passed away. And as the minister he walked in, now he is the minister to God and the leader over a whole nation. So a principle for leadership is you ought to be willing to start small. Start at the bottom and work your way up. And in my experience, the best leaders, bosses, managers that I've ever had started at the bottom. They understand everything as they move their way up. Not some big wig fancy guy that comes out of college and into that leadership role. He never has a clue of what's going on and he causes all sorts of turmoil and contention. The best leaders, the best managers, the best bosses, the best soldiers that become leaders of the army are the ones that start at the bottom and work their way up. Just my experience. But I believe that you see that also here in Joshua. Verse 4 continues and it says... From the wilderness and this Lebanon, even unto the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites, and unto the great sea toward the going down of the sun shall be your coast. Verse 5, there shall not any man be able to stand before thee all the days of thy life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with thee. I will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. What a promise to come directly from the mouth of God. You are not to fear what any man can do unto you. Flesh will fail, but God clearly indicates here, I will not fail. I will not forsake thee. So any man that comes against you, that arm of flesh will fail. And God says, I will not. I will destroy. I will remove. I will tear down in order to build you up and cause you all the days of your life to be successful. That's what he's promising Joshua. And I believe you can take that promise today as a Christian and apply that to yourself. Just say, you know what? I believe by faith that no one is going to stand before me all the days of my life. Why? Because God's not going to fail me. Why? Because God is not going to forsake me. Why? Because God promised that every place that I walk with him will be given to me. Every challenge, every struggle, every situation in life God has given me power to overcome in and through those opportunities. Now the call of promise, call and promise to Joshua comes up here in verse 6. Look at this. Be strong and of a good courage. And this becomes the, the, the slogan of Joshua's ministry. Be strong and of a good courage. And you can even find that in Moses' ministry before. Be strong and of a good courage. For unto this people... Shalt thou divide for an inheritance the land which I swear unto their fathers to give them. So there's the call of Joshua. If you missed it, it's clear. Thou shalt divide for an inheritance the land. So God's call to him is that he would be strong, he would be courageous, and here's your ministry, Joshua, to go into that land and divide it unto all the people for an inheritance. That's your role. That's your responsibility, God says to him. And then he affirms it again by giving him a promise in verse 7. Only be thou strong and very courageous that thou mayest observe to do according to all the law which Moses my servant commanded thee. Turn not from it to the right hand or to the left that thou mayest prosper whithersoever thou goest. So full prosperity wherever he goes is promised if he will only trust God, follow God, 
obey God and God will ensure that he sees it through. And so there's your next principle for leadership, especially as a Christian. Simply trust the Lord. Trust him that if he's called you to do something like divide a nation for an inheritance, give them their land. If he's called you to do that, if he's called you to be a great father unto your children, if he's called you to, 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 to lead at your workplace, if he's called you to be a mom, if he's called you to do whatsoever it is, and you're courageous and strong in that, God will ensure that you prosper if you simply obey his commands as you're walking with him and trusting him. Trust God, follow God. He will see you through and to the end of the calling that he has for your life. Now, we might ask the question then, what enables the believer to overcome in these scenarios? Of course, you got to trust God. Of course, you got to follow after him. Of course, you got to keep the commandments. But really, where do we derive our power from as believers? Verse 8 gives us a great answer, and this is universal, and this is why this verse is so famously preached from. Verse 8, This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. So your prosperity then is based upon you meditating in this book of the law day and night. And what was the book of the law at this point? Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Those first five books were what they had to meditate upon day and night, moment by moment, always and forever. Meditate simply means to think upon it, to ponder it, to study it. You have to be Letting these things work in you day and night and always be thinking about them. We saw in Deuteronomy chapter 6, I believe, talking about leading children. And they said, when you rise up and when you lay down, wherever you are, whatever you are doing, teach these diligently to your children. And the same Joshua has grown up and learned under that tutelage. And now he has the same charge given to him. Meditate on these things day and night. And by extension, I believe, teach these things day and night. These need to be like your food. They need to be more necessary than food. If you remember, Job said that. He esteemed the words of his mouth more than his daily meat, more than his necessary food is what he regarded the word of God is. And it's that important to us. We need to consider it that important to us. Some of us work physical jobs. We get up and we get our good breakfast into us. More important than that good breakfast is getting up and getting this breakfast into you. Start meditating upon the Word of God the moment you're up. Start eating this scripture the second your eyes open. As soon as you open, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Think of to yourself a psalm like Psalm chapter 1 and verse 1. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. And continues, and he shall be like a tree, planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. And if you don't have these things committed to your memory, how are you going to meditate upon them day and night lest you walk with your scriptures all the time? Start committing these things to our memories. Start having these internalized so we can meditate upon them always, every moment, every day, all the time. Then you will be prosperous. That's where prosperity comes from. It's come from our ability to meditate upon the word of the, the Lord and let that work in us. Next, we need to observe to do all the things that are written therein. Because it's one thing to just memorize a whole bunch of scriptures and do nothing with it. The Bible actually describes that the person that hears these things and doeth them not as a forgetful hearer. In other words, they're not going to remember these things because they're not applying what they have heard. So, we need to observe to do. The Bible says in Psalms, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. And so our ability to prosper... And our ability to have good success comes from our ability to meditate on the law day and night, committing it to our hearts, and that will make it so we do not sin against God. Why? Because every time I go to do something that is against God, He will bring that to our remembrance. And He will remind us through the Scriptures, especially now in the New Testament, with the power of the Holy Spirit upon us and in us and working through us, he will bring these things into remembrance whatsoever God has taught us 
through his word. And therefore, we can be prosperous, and therefore, we can have good success. So then, another principle for leadership that you can grab from a verse like this is that our success and our prosperity as leaders comes from our ability to be obedient into a higher power. And there's no power but of God. And so if we are yielding our obedience to Him always, we will have good success. We will be prosperous. And I don't need to dig into that further. That's what the Bible is promising us here in this verse. The book of the law shall be in thy mouth. Meditate day and night. Observe to do all that is written therein. And then thou shalt make thy way prosperous. And then thou shalt have good success. See, we don't need a success help book, a self-help book. Joshua 1 and verse 8 has it all contained. And you know what he points to? The Word of God. Go there and pull from these scriptures, pull from these commands, pull from these instructions for life, and then you'll be prosperous. Then you'll have good success. Verse 9, it says, Have not I commanded thee? Have not I commanded thee? And it's an interesting thing because God simply asks the question, look, haven't I commanded you all these things? The book of the law. Don't turn from it to the right hand, to the left. I will not fail thee nor forsake thee every place that you, the soul of your... You know that I've stated these and because I've commanded you to do this work, you need to count on the fact that I will see it through. I believe that God doesn't command which you can't keep. In other words, he's not going to tell you to do something that's simply impossible for you to do. Every command of the scripture, you believer, are fully capable in the power of the Holy Spirit to fulfill in your life. He's not giving you some unachievable benchmark for your life. Why is that so? Because we might look at some commands, we might look at some challenges and say, I can't overcome in that. It's so because he is there to do it for us. And that's how we walk as Christians. God works in and through His people and creates in them and facilitates the opportunity for them to be prosperous and have good success. So the principle for leadership then is don't delegate or order anything you're not willing to do yourself. Right? God commands something and He knows that He is able to see you through to that end. Why? Verse 9 continues. Be strong and of a good courage. Be not afraid, afraid, neither be thou dismayed, for the Lord thy God is with thee whithersoever I goest. Have not I commanded you? I'm going to be with you wherever you go as you try to succeed in this area. So as God orders or charges or commands us to do something, he's absolutely willing to do it himself. And I've experienced this as well. Sometimes you get a boss at work that he's just going to point you to do all sorts of things. And you know it's something that he wouldn't touch with a 10-foot pole. But my best bosses were the ones that were willing to get in there and get dirty. But they sent me to do something because it was easier for me and he could be mindful of something else. And then when I went and did it, I did it with the confidence that I know that he's not just sending me to the muck that he's not willing to touch. He's actually willing to follow through and do the same job if need be. But he asked me to do it. He commanded me to do it. And that's how God works too. He's not going to command something that he's not willing to do for you and through you and in you. So upon this charge that God has just given to Joshua, that basically he will go into the land and divide it for an inheritance unto the people, if he turns not to the left hand or to the right hand, but observes to do everything written herein, if he meditates on the Bible, then he will be prosperous. Then he will have good success. Only be thou strong and very courageous. Upon this charge, Joshua then begins to rally the whole camp. And watch. He does this from a position of extreme faith. Utmost faith in God's promise. Verse 10. Then Joshua commanded the officers of the people, saying, Pass through the host and command the people, saying, Prepare you victuals." For within three days ye shall pass over this Jordan to go in to possess this land which the Lord your God giveth you to possess it. Do you see any doubt in Joshua's statement? He says, hey, get some food stuffs together. Get some provision together. Gather some meat together because you're about to go into Jordan. You're about to possess this land because God's going to give it to you. 
There's no doubt in Joshua's voice as he charges the people, rallies the camp. He's got complete faith in God to provide. Where he guides, he will provide. That's one of those funny sayings. Wherever God is guiding you, he will certainly provide a way for you to overcome and be successful. That's how God works. He's going to guide you to this challenge, guide you to this opportunity, guide you to this job, guide you to this situation, and he's going to provide exactly what you need to be successful and prosperous in that. Only be strong and have a good courage. Only be mindful of the scriptures and only turn not to the left hand nor to the right hand from obeying and observing to do according to all that you have heard. That's simply a faith position. That's, I mean, I'm trusting God and I'm doing the best I can under his leadership. And God will certainly care for you and bring you in to possess the land. Whatever the land is in your life. Whatever you need to overcome. Now, verse 12 begins to talk. He begins to turn to the Reubenites, the Gadites, and half the tribe of Manasseh. It says, And to the Reubenites, and to the Gadites, and to half the tribe of Manasseh, spake Joshua, saying, Remember the word which Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded you, saying, The Lord your God hath given you rest, and hath given you this land. Now, in your own time, you can go back in Numbers chapter 32 is where this story is recorded. Numbers chapter 32. But I'll continue down into verse 14 here. It says, Your wives and your little ones and your cattle shall remain in the land which Moses gave to you on this side of Jordan, but ye shall pass over before your brethren, armed all the mighty men of valor, and help them, until the Lord have given your brethren rest, as he hath given you, and they also have possessed the land which the Lord your God giveth them, then ye shall return unto the land of your possession and enjoy it which the Lord's, which Moses the Lord's servant gave you on this side of Jordan through the up, um, toward the sun rising. So here's another principle for leadership. Don't be hasty to tear down the work and the agreements of your predecessor. Doesn't Joshua here acknowledge that that there was an agreement made between you and Moses. He gave you land on this side of Jordan only. The agreement was that when your brethren go in to fight for the land of Canaan, you will go with them. So set up your stables, set up your herds, set up your farmhouses, leave a few strong men here with the wives and with the children, and you, your mighty men, should go into the land and fight with your brethren. And God, or God was of course, apprehensive about this. And I can see the problem that these had was they were more content, the Reubenites, the Gadites, and half the tribe of Manasseh to stay in the old world, the land that wasn't promised to them, the land that, that was not flowing with milk and honey, but they were comfortable there, weren't they? So they made this agreement with Moses and said, we want to stay here. It's good land for our herds. And Moses just lost it in anger. And he thought, like, Lord, help me. <laughs> These people have done it again. And here after 40 years and 40 years, he's like, it's going to be another 40 years because we have these that are bringing this evil report. And that's not what they were doing exactly. But nevertheless, they refused to go into the promised land just like their parents had done. And he's like, oh no, this is going to be really bad. I'm going to be stuck here again. And we're going to go through this cycle all over again. Nevertheless, when they came to him and explained what they would do and what they were willing to do, he agreed, okay, if you still go into this land and fight for your brethren to give them what's theirs to inherit, then you can possess this land. Then you can enjoy this possession on that side of Jordan and not go into the land that promised God promised them. Now, I don't think this was a right decision for them to make. I think they had something better waiting for them. Nevertheless, you see that Joshua, by principle, was not hasty to tear down those agreements of his predecessor, Moses. You know what it is? It's like when you're at a workplace and there's a new manager that comes in and he just wants to clean the house, change everything, shake it up. It causes great contention, does, doesn't it? But Joshua here was wise enough, though maybe he didn't even agree with what had taken place and what Moses had agreed upon with this two and a half tribes. Joshua nevertheless upheld the agreement that his predecessor had made with them and he, as a result of these principles that we have seen, reaps the reward of a, a willing group of people to follow him. He reaps the reward of his hard work. 
his faithful diligence, and he gets a smooth transition into leadership. And you'll see that as you begin to read into verse 16. Now, we've learned about what leadership should be like. Now look at what followship should be like. Look what makes a good follower. Verse 16, And they answered Joshua, saying, All that thou commandest us, we will do. And whithersoever thou sendest us, we will go. Do you know what that is? That's obedience to the commands of their leadership. The obedience to the commands of their, of their authority. And that's what a good follower does. And that's what leaders love to have. Is people that are willing to be obedient and follow what they're commanded to do. So when you go to your workplace or when you're submitting under authorities in your life, be obedient to follow the commands that are given. Joshua reaped a great reward here because this is one of the smoothest transitions you see in the Bible. You see all the time when, when a king changes, just chaos ensues. And that happens at, at workplaces too, where, where chaos ensues. That happens in families as well. If there's a split up or a breakup, a new ruler comes in, a new boss comes in, suddenly things just fall apart. But, but Joshua, as the servant of Moses, became the successor to Moses and followed some great principles. I believe he learned from God and from the word of God and from Moses, his instructor, he was able to obtain a smooth transition. The next you see, be obedient to commands. The next thing that a follower should be is faithful or devoted to the man. Look at verse 17. According as we hearkened unto Moses in all things so will we hearken unto thee. Only the Lord thy God be with thee as he was with Moses. You know what that was? Them affirming that we will follow you as you follow the Lord. Like it says in the New Testament, the Apostle Paul encourages Christians, follow me as I follow the Lord. And the people here affirm, we will be faithful. We will be devoted unto you, Joshua, in all things. Even as we followed Moses, we will follow thee. Only God be with thee as he was with Moses. If God is with you, we're with you. And that's what they're affirming. They will be faithful and devoted to the man appointed leadership over them. The next thing that we see after being obedient to commands, being faithful and devoted to the man that's in charge, all followers should be committed to the mission. Verse 18, Whosoever he be that doth rebel against thy commandment, will not hearken unto the words, and all that thou commandest him, he shall be put to death. Only be strong and of a good courage. And there's the mission statement there in their affirmation of, hey, we'll follow you, be obedient to your commands. We'll follow you, be faithful and devoted in as much as you follow God. We're on board with you. We'll follow you and we'll be committed to the mission. And the mission is that we will be strong and of a good courage. Even as you've heard from God and even as Moses heard from God, we will follow that mission statement. We will be strong. We will be of a good courage. And anybody who's not willing to get on board, let them be put to death. This is what they're saying here. So this is what good followers should be. Obedient, faithful, devoted, and committed to the mission. And we don't need to go over the principles of leadership again, but you can go back and check them out. In the recording, and this is what this transition ensues. It's it's God calling a man to a work, showing how the man had developed, the things that he learned as he came into transition and became the head over a whole nation. God gives him his charge. He tells him how he's going to have good success. And as a result of all God has done in working this situation out, we see a people that gets fully on board with the mission and the man that's about to lead the charge into the promised land. And this is a great stage that is set in Joshua chapter 1 for their mission to succeed. The inheritance will be divided in that land among the people. And that's what we're going to see as Joshua plays out. This is how the book of Joshua will unfold itself. Thank you, Father.